and welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. And I'm Kevin the Dad. Yep. And Jules, what did you pick for us this time? This week, we are listening to Frank Sinatra with the Red Norvo Quintet live in Australia, 1959. But first, Dad, what do we need to know about the chairman of the board? Well, we need to know that this is going to be the Cliff Notes version of Frank's life. But there's a lot of books and websites out there for you to dive even deeper. Oh, yeah. Okay, so... Francis Albert Sinatra was born December 12, 1915, in a tenement in Hoboken, New Jersey. His parents were Antonino Sinatra, who was a boxer and firefighter, and Natalina Dolly Sinatra. Now, Dolly was the dominant factor in the development of Frank. Mm -hmm. It's alleged that she was abusive to him as a child, one story being that she threw him down a flight of stairs. I've heard that one before. Yeah. Now, Frank's idol was Bing Crosby. And they would lay the star together in high society. But being, but Frank being worshipful of Bing, he decided to be a popular singer. Sorry, I had a brain fart there for a second. <laughs> uh, he joined the local group, the Hoboken Four. They won a talent competition on the Major Bose Amateur Hour and toured the country. Frank was the only one who was serious about a music career, and the group soon broke up. Frank sang with local dance bands or remote radio, radio broadcasts. In 1939, trumpeter Harry James discovered Frank while Sinatra was singing in waiting tables at the Rustic Cabin in Inglewood Cliffs, New Jersey. Gotta start somewhere. Yep. Frank sang with James for six months. Their most famous song was All or Nothing at All, a flop in 1939, but a million seller when re-released in 1943. James let Frank out of his contract when Tommy Dorsey offered Frank more money. Frank was influenced by Dorsey's trombone playing and worked hard to improve his breath control. Frank would master both ballads and up-tempo numbers during this period. Mm. By 1942, Frank was more popular than Dorsey and wanted to leave. Dorsey was not happy, even though Frank offered to stay with the band for one more year. Eventually, Frank left and Sinatra Mania was born. Mm -hmm. Female fans, also known as the Bobby Soxers, just mm -hmm. totally lost their shit. Mm -hmm. Frank recorded for Columbia Records from 1943 to 1952. He was successful until around 1948 when his popularity declined. He didn't want to change his style, and there were reports about his uh, friendships with organized crime figures. Uh -huh. Plus, years of singing as many as 100 songs per day Oof. What took its toll, and he lost his voice completely for a few months in 1950 because of vocal cord hemorrhaging. Oh, Al. Uh. In 1951, he divorced, he divorced his first knife, first wife, Nancy, from whom we got Tina, Frank Jr., and Nancy. <laughs> or maybe Nancy Jr., since her mom's name was Nancy. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, he married Ava Gardner, and they divorced in 1957. He'd go on to marry Mia Farrow briefly in the 60s, and even after they got divorced, they were still good friends. Yeah. Barbara Marks was his last wife. They married in 1976 and stayed married until Frank's death in 1998. And he was even engaged to Lauren Bacall at one point. Huh. That I broke off, though, quickly because I think he realized she'll, she's going to love no one else but Bogey and this isn't fair to her. And she said she was hurt by it a little bit, but looking back on it, good idea. Hmm. Uh, Columbia did not renew Frank's contract in 1952. He was at the bottom. But he made a comeback in 1953, not in music, but in film. Mm -hmm. He'd already made some MGM musicals in the 40s, the best being On the Town. Frank pleaded with Columbia Pictures president Harry Kahn for the role of Maggio in From Here to Eternity, just like Johnny Fontaine wanted that movie role in The Godfather. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Frank was not a fan of Mario Puzo. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Frank did win an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, signed with Capitol Records, and began cranking out what I considered his greatest albums. In the late 50s and early 60s, the Rat Pack was born. Core members were Frank, mm -hmm. Dean Martin, and Sammy Davis Jr. Peripheral members were Peter Lawford, mm -hmm. Joey Bishop, Shirley MacLaine, and... What? Honorary member... JFK. Oh, yeah, because what was it? Peter Lawford was married to somebody? Yeah, it was some it was? sort of in-law yeah. relation thing. Mm -hmm. Frank Dean and Sammy would ad-lib on stage and sometimes sing. <laughs> Vegas was Frank's kingdom, and he and Sammy worked to desegregate the hotels and casinos during that period. And as Frank said, if anybody looks at Sammy and his band funny, break both their legs. Uh -huh. 
The mob connections sprang up again during this period, and this cost him some of his fan base and jeopardized political friendships. Mm -hmm. The Kennedys would eventually distance themselves from Frank, which I don't think he ever forgave them for doing. Nope, he didn't. And it may have been one of the factors that caused him to switch parties. Mm -hmm. uh, the mob yeah. also distanced themselves from Frank as well, but maybe as a favor to Frank. Ah, uh, okay. In 1960, Frank formed his own label, Reprise Records. He put out a staggering 14 albums from 1961 to 1963. Whoa! And some of them might have even been pretty good. And he could still get the hits. Strangers in the Night, That's Life, My Way, and Let Us Not Forget, Something Stupid with Daughter Nancy. And check out our Nancy Sinatra podcast. Mm -hmm. He announced a retirement in 1971, but came back in 1973. Now, from 1973 to 1994, he only released seven studio albums. 1980's trilogy gave him his last big hit, theme from New York, New York. Sorry, Liza. His last recordings were duets and duets too. Critically, they did not do well, but they sold millions. Oh, yeah. Frank's final public performance was in 1995. He died May 14, 1998, after suffering two heart attacks. He is considered to be the greatest singer of the 20th century. Now, Live in Australia in 1959 was available only as a bootleg for years, so as such, the sound quality ain't that great. Mm -hmm. It did get a proper label release in 1997 on Capitol's Blue Note jazz label, rather than on Capitol itself. Mm -hmm. Frank had known vibraphonist Red Norvo since 1939. In 1958, in Frank's official capacity as vice president of the Sands, he hired Norvo to play for six weeks. That turned into six months. <laughs> Red learned Frank's songbook, and they played some gigs stateside. They played two shows in Australia, March 31st and April 1st, 1959. Most of the songs here are from the second night. When they got back to the U.S., they tried to record together, but it just never came off. Scheduling conflicts yeah. were... That was the big thing. Now, as for me, the reason I picked this up was that I kept hearing that this was Frank's greatest concert performance ever. But is it? Let's find out. Mm -hmm. Now, before Frank comes on, Red Norvo and his quintet warm up the audience by playing two instrumentals, Perdido and Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. And then Red Norvo introduces Frank by saying, we've added a boy singer. <laughs> and with that, let's start the show. First track, I Could Have Danced All Night. The two versions of this I'm most familiar with are performed by Julie Andrews and Marnie Nixon as Eliza Doolittle from My Fair Lady. So I was kind of worried about what Frank would do to it since I'm used to sopranos performing this with dreamy vibrato. His is more sensual and intimate with how he keeps the volume soft, but you can tell his passion isn't lacking. The only thing I don't like is how he Sinatra's up the lyrics with, I could have spread my wings and done a zillion things I've never done before. Lerner and Lowe would have raised an eyebrow, but then again, Frank's not a cockney flower girl. A cover that makes me miss how Broadway songs became American standards back when musicals were a part of the cultural zeitgeist. Uh -huh. mm. This was written by Alan J. Lerner and Frederick Lowe. Mm -hmm. um, from at, and from at the time, this was from Frank's latest album, Come Dance With Me, which uh. had come out in January 1959. Now, from My Fair Lady, which at the time was only three years old, came on coming out in 1956. Yep. Now, per Wikipedia, Eliza Doolittle sings it after an impromptu dance with Professor Henry Iggins. <laughs> I listened to the Julie Andrews version. It's very high-spirited. It is. Very. Yes. Now, Frank just eases into it, makes it his own. He's in total command, and he makes the song swing. Basically, he sings the one verse slash chorus two times, but being Frank, he changes things the second time around. Yeah. He could have begged for lots more instead of more. He could have done a zillion things instead of a thousand, but I don't think those changes come across as shtick or vagacy. It's if like, you're a theater fan, they do. If you know the original lyrics, then they do. Yeah, but I don't think Frank's like being disrespectful to the song. No, that would it's come... just kind of irritating to, to people who, are, who have grown up with one version and that's when they hold near and dear to their hearts. I can kind of relate to that. Like yeah. if you hear one song and you're used to it and then someone else comes along and does like a faster pace or a slower pace or whatever, you're like, no, what the hell is this? not how it's supposed to be. Yeah, it feels but, wrong. I, I mean, Frank would definitely lean into more of the doobie doobie doo Vegas stuff as the 60s went along. And it just and as you started to care less. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Nailed it. Which is why I don't like his duets album because you can tell he's half-assing it. 
Well, the thing with that was like the other people were not in the studio with him. Yeah. He just sang and sent out the tapes to, I guess, whoever Capital thought would be good or yeah. someone must have thought, hey, you need to do um, Night and Day with Bono. Oh, God. All right, next track. <laughs> I get a kick out of you. One of his biggest songs that I've heard before, but what made me feel as if I heard it for the first time was the addition of the drums, striking every time Frank said, uh, says kick to give the musical equivalent of that gesture. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I have had a brain fart as well. I guess this is the brain fart episode, folks. Let's rewind and go back to track number two. Just one of those things, and then Thank we'll you. get to I get a kick out of you later. Sorry. The, the room is starting to smell of fartage, folks. <laughs> I scrolled past too bad. Anyway, take two. Next track, Just One of Those Things. A song that surprised me with the subject matter. Cole Porter writes about a one-night stand that was, well, just one of those things. Now the heat has died down and it's time to go. But when Sinatra sings it, he doesn't come across as cruel or mean-spirited. He acknowledges the fun and passion, but gracefully bows out and wishes his date well in a way that makes it sound mutual. What makes this cover is Red Norvo on the vibraphone with the call and response the instrument does with Frank at the end, adding short, sharp notes that sound playful. Great song. We need more Cole Porter sung in our lives. Uh, this is the first of three Cole Porter songs in a row. Yep. Frank sings a total of five during the concert. Mm -hmm. um, just one of those crazy flings. But even as the band and Frank swing along, I think there's some regret being voiced. Granted, not slowly or even in a regretful singing style, but it's still there. Because he sings, if we'd thought a bit about the end of it, when we started painting the town, we'd have been aware that our love affair was too hot to cool down. Mm. And yet Frank carries on, sings past the dawning realization of this could have been the one. Goodbye and then, here's hoping we'll meet now and then. And again, Frank makes it all so effortless, which he does on pretty much every song here. Yeah. But I'm sure he had to work really hard at it to make it seem so easy. Oh, yeah. Now, finally, too, I get a kick out of you. So as I said, one of his biggest songs that I've heard before and what made me feel as if I heard it for the first time was the addition of the drum striking every time Frank says kick to give the musical equivalent of that gesture. And then you have the vibraphone sounding like the musical equivalent of champagne bubbles. But what I'm most surprised huh. about, though, is that Frank changed the lyric of some they may go for cocaine to being about sniffing perfume instead of snorting powder. And I had to wonder, why did he change it? Did he do this stuff and wasn't a fan? Was Australia cracking down on drug use at the time and he didn't want to offend anyone? Well, what's the reason? The mind races. But what made me step back even more was that Frank says it's clear the woman he loves isn't into him and how he sounds so put out very briefly before he snaps out of it and starts singing again. As if every time he sees her, he forgets that he's really lonely and longing and that his past is tragic. If she lights up his life in any way, he's happy. Which on one hand, aww. But on the other, Guy, you're Frank Sinatra. You can find another day in any day. Think better of yourself. Um... I think with the thing about the uh, cocaine turning into champagne, or no, not the perfume from Spain, mm -hmm. um, I think it had to do with, oh, yeah, we all forgot cocaine is illegal. And I th I'm not sure who it was, but someone did ask Cole Porter, hey, can you change the lyric for that one line? Oh, Which okay. he did. Because sometimes Frank would sing cocaine, sometimes he'd sing the champagne. I mean, from Spain. Yeah. Sorry. Champagne is the previous lyric. Thank you. Okay, very urbane lyrics, as for example, fighting vainly the old ennui. Mm -hmm. I love that line. Yeah. I love it. And it starts off slowly until Frank gets to the line, and I suddenly turn and see your fabulous face. And just the sight of that face kicks everything into gear. Mm -hmm. It picks up Frank. Obviously, it makes him swing. And he sings how this woman is the only thing he gets a kick out of, not champagne, perfumes from Spain, and what the hell, not even cocaine. Mm -hmm. And listening to his phrasing, the first time he sings, I get a kick out of you, he sings, I get a kick, and then he stops. And, I, and the first time I heard this, I thought, oh, shit, he forgot the words. But no, of course not. No, he didn't. Eventually, he sings, out of you, and you think, oh, my God, he's not keeping in time. But he is. Yeah, he is. He makes it work because he's frank and he knows what he's doing. Yeah. He probably sang this song so many times that he's probably just decided to play around with it. But then yeah. again, I don't think he do he does it in a vegas -y way. No, not in that He way. makes it work, and it's like, okay, he just made this new, not only for himself, but for, the audience. for everyone who heard it. Yep. Next track. At Long Last Love. The gist of this song is trying to find out whether or not you're in love or merely experiencing the thrill of first attraction. 
What makes this song not work for me is the lyrics with their dated references. First, I don't know what the real McCoy is because I've never heard of it. And turtle soup isn't eaten anymore. You don't even really hear about mock turtles outside Alice in Wonderland. However, Frank sells it with how much fun he's having and how he discovers over the course of the song that he could actually be in love. And he gets more and more happy at the prospect. And it just becomes so joyful, you can forgive the lyric writing when the singer interprets it so well. Yeah, like I said, it's basically asking, is this the real thing or not? Comparing what could be love to either it's either an earthquake or a shock. Is it the good turtle soup or merely the mock? And we don't have turtle soup anymore because it's a conservation thing or, or what? Yeah, probably also due to animal abuse and killing off other turtles. Huh. That's, that's just my guess. So what do you suppose mock turtle soup is? I don't know. Huh. My favorite line is, is it Granada I see or only Asbury Park? Because, you know, you can't compare Spain to New Jersey. No. <laughs> you can't. All right, next track. Willow Weep For Me. The first time I heard this song was at dinner one night, and after hearing, yeah, Mom put on the CD, I think. We were having dinner. And after hearing 30 seconds of it, I put it on my Spotify. However, it's not a song I can listen to that often. Why? Because it doesn't matter if I'm having a great day. As soon as I hear that song, I am instantly down in the dumps. Frank's performance exemplifies how vibrato can be used so that a singer's voice sounds like it's about to burst into tears. Vibrato is the vibration in a singer's voice, for those who don't know the term. His love left him and broke his heart, and now he wants the willow to weep for him as the earth swallows him whole. It's that feeling when depression just overwhelms you and you feel like you can barely move with barely enough energy to even put a slice of bread in the toaster. Everyone who's had undiagnosed depression and left unregulated can relate to that. And the band is once again consummate, especially with, bra with bass player Red Wooten playing those low notes that set the dreary mood. This song reminds me of how Brene Brown found out people listen to sad songs more than happy songs, because in sad songs, the sense of love is sometimes stronger. And if you want a great example, listen to this track. Mm -hmm. This was written in 1932 by Anne Ronell, one of the few female singers in the great American songbook. Originally, this was on 1958's Frank Sinatra Sings Only for the Lonely. Mm -hmm. So Frank's version was still sort of new. But first, why is the tree called the Weeping Willow? Due to a misunderstanding by botanist Carl Linnaeus back in the 1700s of a tree described in Psalm 137, by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion on the willows where we hung up our lyres. It should have been poplars instead of willows. Oh, but oops. Weeping willow sounds better than weeping poplar. Yeah, more alliterative. Yeah, so Frank's down by the river asking the willow to weep for him in sympathy so he's not crying alone. This is definitely not swing time. This is no. like uh, this is like 180 degrees from it. Mm -hmm. And how about that note at the end Frank holds when he sings the word me? Mm -hmm. Impressive. Oh, God. Yep. <gasps> yep, yep. If, if you're having the world's greatest day, do not play this song. Yeah, don't, don't. You'll just go to your bedroom, pull down all the shades, and pull the covers over your head. And you won't want to get up out of bed. No. Next track, I've Got You Under My Skin. Enough of that, Downer. Back to happy. The best part of this is the lady who screams once she realizes what song he's about to sing. That's why I love live performances. Anything can happen. And this song can be best summed up as, uh-oh, someone caught feelings. This is an affair that can't possibly last, but Sinatra is madly in love and he won't let her ruin this. And as he thinks about keeping her around, he gets more and more happy, as shown with Sinatra's enthusiasm and with the band gradually crescendoing the music. It's very playful and we know who's going to come out on top in the end. And he's so happy, he's going to sing it again! Yay! Yep. Now, as of 2009, there are 12 versions of Frank singing this song. Wow. Some alive, and one is a duet with Bono. And like I said before, they weren't in the studio together. And it's a good thing they weren't because... When Bono sings the line, don't you know, you old fool, you can't win. If he had been in the studio with Frank, Frank probably would have punched him out. And we all would have said thank you. Yeah. So in album, in album chronological order, this is the ninth release. Okay. Now, normally when someone gets under your skin, they're like an irritant. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Really gets me under the skin. In this case, this one drives Frank crazy, yes, but in a good way. Even though he tries to counsel himself not to fall under her spell, to resist... But why? He knows it's inevitable, even though there's that warning voice that repeats in his air about Frank being a fool and he can never win. So wake up. Nope. Nope. And I've also looked at this as like, 
could be a drug addiction song as well. Yeah. Hello, heroin. <laughs> yep. And as soon as Frank sings, I got you, the audience goes crazy. And yeah, there's that one woman who lets out the scream, causing Frank, without missing a beat, to reply, get your hand off that broad. Yeah. And the song ends after two minutes or so the audience and we, the listener, are led to believe, psych, nope, yeah. Frank just goes back into it, mm -hmm. which I think kind of makes it better because you think, two minutes, this is kind of short, but that's yeah. a whole song. And like, oh, it's not. One more time. Next track, Moonlight in Vermont. I guarantee you that this man has never been to Vermont. Also, fun fact, this is not their state song. That would be These Green Mountains. Having never been to Rome, Vermont, I can't say if this is an accurate depiction. So it doesn't fill me with the romantic yearning Sinatra has for the place. But what I will say is that he is a master of breath support with how he is able to turn a phrase by not breathing in between words, specifically between the words lovely and evening. And again, the bass player adds a nice little touch with the almost pizzicato notes sounding like crackles of electricity traveling down wires. The song itself doesn't grab me, but again, Frank and the Red Norvo Quintet do. Mm -hmm. uh, this is written by John Blackburn and Carl Sustoff. The, the unofficial state song of Vermont. And here's the thing, it doesn't rhyme. No, it doesn't. Not Plus the verses, but not the bridge, are all haiku. Oh, that's interesting. Which kind of renders it, I think the song as a whole, like very impressionistic. Mm. And tough to sing, I bet. Oh, yeah. And the way Frank sings it, he almost makes me want to be there in Vermont in winter. In the snow? Almost. Almost. He's, he's that convincing. But yeah, I was doing some research on it. So I'm like, wow, haiku, that's really interesting. Because the guy started writing that way. And then he realized, yeah, let's just keep going like this. We know it's not going to rhyme, but let's just keep, keep at going. it. Mm. And it works. Yeah. Next track, The Lady is a Tramp. The way I look at this song is, if you're a woman with a free spirit who likes to do things your own way, people are going to label you as a weirdo or outsider, or in this case, tramp. And Twitter will not be having it. <laughs> I used to get confused when I heard this title because I thought Frank was missaying the title of Lady and the Tramp since I saw the movie before I ever listened to this song. But Frank doesn't have any negative opinions of this girl. In fact, he kind of thinks she's cute and plucky and kind of admires her attitude. And something I never knew... This is Richard Rogers and Lawrence Hart from Babes in Arms. Oh man, Rogers must have loved the royalty checks he got when Frank started singing this. Definitely a fun performance where he sings to the audience. But what happened that made him go, ouch? I hope he was okay. We'll never know. Mm. Uh, Frank first sang this in 1957 in the movie Pal Joey. The song itself had been around since 1937. Mm -hmm. Lots of covers of this song by lots of people, but it's definitely Frank's song. Yeah. And... Like you, it took me years to figure out, what does this song mean? I don't get this. But then my understanding is the woman in the title is someone who refuses to play the games of high society. And since she doesn't play those games, she's referred to as, well, see the title. Because mm -hmm. she's too hungry for dinner at eight. I would be too. Mm -hmm. Never bothers with people she hates. Neither would I. Got to respect that. Won't dish the dirt. Doesn't like California. And on and on and on. Mm -hmm. She just is going her own way, and if you don't like that, too bad. And if you want to see a kind of hilarious performance of this, go on TikTok. There's footage of Frank singing this at the Oscars one year, and what's fascinating is the entire audience is bored out of their minds, save for one person. And you watch that thinking, if I was there and Frank Sinatra suddenly came out on stage, I would lose my mind. But these are Hollywood actors who have seen him before, and it's like, oh great, Frank's going to sing again. It's just so interesting to see uh, Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward just bored out of their skull. <laughs> Next track. Not yet. Oh, yep. Yeah, I still got a thing or two to say okay. about this. I like how Frank starts this song off by whistling the tune, and he plays with the lyrics. And again, we get another false ending, and it's worth it because he sings, She's broke. What the hell? <laughs> Love that. Okay. Now, before we get to our next song. Sinatra is it, Speaks. This, oh, we're doing it? Yeah, we are. Okay, go ahead. So, Sinatra Speaks. This isn't a song, but it's a track that we have to talk about. Yeah. So, Frank takes a breather to speak to the audience and to say thanks for coming and he's happy to be with the audience in Australia. And I always find it weird when performers choose not to speak at the beginning or the end, but he's Frank, he can do what he wants. There's a bit of back and forth with the audience and he gives his reason for not being in Australia five years ago. He got stuck in Honolulu and wound up in a bathhouse with a group of Japanese people, which I don't get the joke, but that's not what happened. He also takes the time to introduce the next song, which is a bar song 
people sing in dimly lit corners in Numsville. He's a showman, which not all singers are, but he's a great one. Now, Dad, what's the real reason he couldn't be in Australia five years ago? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll find out in a minute. Um, yeah, so this is the halfway point through the show, and Frank addresses the crowd for about a minute and a half. And he does come up with that shaggy dog story about getting caught in a bar in Honolulu, and the next thing you know, he's in Japan in a public bath with 16 Japanese people. Now, originally, Frank was supposed to have toured Australia in 1957, but canceled two days before opening night. And there are three possible reasons. One, he just didn't want to tour. Two, his friend songwriter Jimmy Van Heusen couldn't get a seat on the flight to Australia. Or three, he just wanted to golf with Sammy. Don't know which one it is. Now, Take your pick. Frank settled with promoter Lee Gordon by performing a series of concerts in the United States with Gordon getting compensation. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of like how Frank, you know, he does eight songs and then he talks to the audience and then he does the last eight songs. Mm -hmm. I find as I get older and I'm watching concerts, it's more, I'm sitting there like less talking, more singing. Mm -hmm. Like granted, your mom and I have been going to these free concerts in the park and I'm just amazed at like how much talking some of these singers will do and it's like no this is why we came here we don't understand your inside jokes to the band just please sing mm -hmm. that's why we're here mm -hmm. and i don't care if i didn't pay for it i still want my money back <laughs> all right next track angel eyes sinatra is alone and bitter at the bar encouraging everyone to drink up so he can forget the fact that his angel eyes isn't there she either ditched him or she broke up with him either way he wants to drink and forget about it well for now anyway after that he wants to find out where his woman went I like how there's moments in the song where the music and Sinatra's choice to not take a breath in between certain words sounds a bit like drunken slurring. It's not exact, but it's noticeable if you listen. He doesn't sound too angry or too brokenhearted, more so the attitude of, I'm done, I give up, kind of disgruntled, but he's accepted it. A great bar song that has a different tone from another one we're about to hear a little bit later. Mm -hmm. uh, this is written by Earl Brent and Matt Dennis. This was also on Frank Sinatra Sings Only for the Lonely from 1958. So Frank's at a bar and his angel eyes hasn't shown up. Uh-oh. And he realizes she ain't gonna show. So what's old Blue Eyes to do? Buy drinks for everyone else in the bar with the money I assume he was going to spend on angel eyes. Mm. That'll show her. Then he tells us that he has to leave to find out who's now number one. He ends it all by singing, excuse me while I disappear. And the way he sings that line, it's like you can almost feel him vanishing. It's like he's Ooh. just fading away. Yeah. Great performance. Very convincing. Because in real life, yeah, Frank would have found out who's number one and give it, given it to him but good. Yeah. And Angel Eyes, she would have learned not to fuck around with Frank. I'll yeah. tell you that much. Read his biography and you'll see an early example of that from his teenage years. I think it was what uh, this friend of his went out with this girl that Sinatra used to date in high school, but they weren't dating anymore. And everyone was like, Dude, that's Frank's girl. You can't go out with her. He's like, what are you talking about? They broke up. And then Sadatra shows up and he's like, you dating my girl? Yeah. Punched him in the face. <laughs> so he learned. Next track, Come Fly With Me. I sang this once at a voice recital and it went okay. A good performance, but not one of my best since I wanted to sing like Frank. And that's pretty hard to do when you're a teenage mezzo-soprano. I think the reason this live performance doesn't work compared to the recording is is because the string section captures the sensation of planes and angels flying through the sky. There's no feeling of being swept up in romance like the original. It's cute, and this song shouldn't be cute, it should soar. And Frank changing the lyrics doesn't help either. If you want a good version of this, stick with the classic one. This was written by Sammy Kahn and Jimmy Van Heusen from the 1957 album of the same name, The Concept, A Musical Trip Around the World. Moonlight in Vermont is also on this album. Mm. Anyway, this is always a fun song. Best part on the studio version, it was when Frank sings about the one-man band in Peru who toot his flute for you. Mm -hmm. I can't do the line justice, but just the way he delivers that line is worth the whole song. And I think he does a good job with the song live, too. And again, he's with Red and Red's quintet, so you're not going to get that big band arrangement. Yeah. But I think they do... A great job and once again he's just so relaxed in his delivery it just makes it all so effortless mm -hmm. and funny thing about the album cover that come fly with me when frank saw it he hated it because really he said it looked like an ad for twa and i looked at the album cover and i thought i could see yeah that. he's right he's exactly right hmm. 
Next. Come fly with me on TWA, baby. <laughs> Next track, all the way. So someone in the audience falls asleep, and Frank is not having it, singing a high note that is so pitchy and awful it jolts the guy awake. Then he goes back to singing the song as normal. Sinatra is his best when he sings sincerely, and I think he does that when he respects the sincerity of the lyrics. This is a perfect song for first dance at a wedding, saying, I don't know what the rest of our lives are going to be like, but I promise you that I can love you and try my best through the good early years. Which is very romantic and is also a good sign that you found a partner who's a straight shooter. A good track to dance to except for the beginning, which let that be a lesson to you, audience members. Yeah, this one also was written by uh, Sammy Kahn and Jimmy Van Heusen. And Frank starts out singing the song the way you'd expect until he gets to all the way and just goes completely off key. Then he says, nobody sleeps in this act, Freddy. Mm -hmm. And I looked, and no one in the band is named Freddy, but someone in the band isn't pulling their weight, and Frank served noticed, or maybe he knew someone in the audience named Freddy, and they were just, like you said, nodding off. Or maybe that's what he says, like like a nickname, like, you know, hey, Jack, or hey, Schmo. You know yeah, I mean? could, yeah that's it could I, be. That's what I thought it was. But then he, res he restarts it, and he sings it fine, and he realized, yeah, this guy could do anything he wanted with any song. And like you said, when... The 60s and 70s came along. And he just wasn't caring. He was just going to do whatever he felt like because he was Frank. Mm -hmm. The song's message, if you're going to love someone, don't do a half-assed job of it. Do a full-ass job. Never half-ass two things. Whole-ass one thing. Exactly. Ron Swanson. Next track, Dancing in the Dark. I never really got the appeal of this one. Two people are dancing in the dark and they can face anything together come what may. But we already heard that sort of story before with All the Way. And that previous track works way better than this one. I have no problem with a more upbeat song conveying the same message, but it doesn't really grab me. Huh, we have that in common. Hmm. Written by Howard Dietz and Arthur Schwartz, also from Come Dance With Me. This is an okay song. There's nothing wrong with it at all, and Frank does a fine job, but it's never really moved me. And maybe the whole point of it is like, yeah, we're dancing in the dark, but what happens when the lights go on? Not like they look at each other like, oh my God, you're who I'm dancing with, but it's like, okay, now we have to go back out and face the everyday reality of the world. Mm -hmm. And we just have that moment of dancing in the dark where, you know, we can just forget about all that. Mm. But right. yeah, okay, okay song. Yeah. Next track, One for My Baby. The only other version I've heard of this song is snippets of Bette Midler performing this on Johnny Carson's last episode of The Tonight Show, and he requested her to do it specifically. However, Sinatra never ceases to feel like a gut punch. It's quarter to three, and he's alone in the bar, with no one but the bartender to whom he vents his troubles. His baby left him, and he wants to talk his feelings away while nursing a beer. The moment where he sings about talking his feelings away while making his voice quiver just breaks your heart. It's always the little things he does with his vibrato to convey his emotions. Eventually, his torch is drowned, he thanks the barman for the cheer and music and leaves walking off into the dark. It's a bit of emotional catharsis since he's done pouring out his guts, but man, what an emotional couple of minutes. It's why he's one of the greats. Mm -hmm. This was written by Harold Arlen and Johnny Mercer, also mm -hmm. from Frank Sinatra Sings Only, Only for the Lonely. Lonely. Yep. This song's been covered by everyone, even Donald Duck. Really? Because I went on Wikipedia just to see all the cover versions, and at the very bottom it said Donald Duck 2022. And yes, it came up this year on Wait For It. The Mouse Pack, Mickey and Friends oh, yes. singing classic standards. And yes, I listened to it. I played a snippet of it for you, I think. And the things I do for you listeners. Why does this exist? <laughs> I have absolutely no idea. I had your mom come in the room and listen to it. Oh, that's what she was I alluding said, to. I said, I couldn't imagine any little kids sitting through this. And maybe it's grown-ups who are trying to be hip or ironic. I have absolutely no idea. If Frank wasn't dead already, this is what would have killed him. Or he would have gone and killed Donald Duck. That's true. As for Frank's version, no contest. It's the ultimate. Studio, live, doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. This, to me, is like the man's song. If I had to pick one, this would be it. Mm -hmm. Now, the inspiration for, this, for the song was Johnny Mercer's affair with Judy Garland. Ooh. She was 19. He was 32. Ew. He knew it had to end, hence the lyrics, but this torch that I found, it's got to be drowned or it might explode. But it didn't. Oh, they no. just kept it going on. 
And Johnny Mercer's wife, who he remained married to for 46 years, knew that she was always going to come in second place. Oh, shoot. Yep. Ouch. So it all comes down to the singing singer bending the air of Bartender Joe. That last two left in the bar and Frank's just letting it all out. And it seems like he's getting drunker as he's singing the song because he gives it the old, you may not know it, but I'm a poet. I'm like, yeah. Ugh. But he does achieve some sort of clarity at the end with the torch line where he realizes, you know, that's it. And then he sings about that long, long road that he has to face once he gets out of the bar. Mm -hmm. But it's just a great performance. And it reminds me of this old Playboy cartoon from the 1950s by Mad Magazine cartoonist Jack Davis. It's this drunkard standing at a bar with a baby. He's holding he's holding his baby. Uh, and the caption is, what the hell? Make it one for my baby and one for the road. road. <laughs> Next track, All of Me. No, this isn't the John Legend song, Google. This track proves that Sinatra can hit high notes legitimately in case all the way scared you off. Sinatra's woman ripped his heart out from his chest and he makes his final case. If you're going to take that, take all of me, because what have I got to lose? And he sings it with the energetic plea of someone making his case without having a care in the world. We don't know if he succeeds or not, but with those high notes, he's giving it his all, and we know his plea was definitely heard. Mm -hmm. This was written by Gerald Marks and Seymour Simons. This and the next two songs feature a local orchestra, and it's swing time again. She's got his heart, so hey, you might as well take the rest of him, <laughs> even though she left him. He's mm -hmm. like, hey, you know... Just, just l l take the whole package, baby. Why not? And, you know, you think with, with, with a topic like that, that it would be more slower, like almost like a begging song. But he's just like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, just, I'm sure I'll be all right even if you don't. And I got to say, this song reminds me of the Lily Tomlin, Steve Martin movie of the same name. Mm. Have you ever seen it? No, I haven't. Highly, highly recommended. Steve Martin should have gotten nominations for both Best Actor and Best Actress. Oh, interesting. You've got to see this movie. All right. Next track, On the Road to Mandalay, one of Richard Kipling's most famous poems. And if you want a great recitation of it, Google Charles Dance performing it on The Crown on Netflix. Really? He does the whole thing? Uh, I think he only did a snippet of it, but what he did was pretty impressive. But this is a very different take, one that was banned in England at the insistence of Kipling's surviving relatives. Now I want to hear Frank sing about Ricky Tiki Tavi or Mowgli, but he's dead, so we can't do that. I think he was trying to create his own jazzy version of Rogers and Hammerstein's Bali High from South Pacific. How there's this romantic place and a special someone calling your name and beseeching you to come back. I'm not a fan of the song, but wow, the orchestra is having some fun with this, getting to sound mysterious and playful out. Mm -hmm. And Frank is having a lot of fun, too. So it's a pretty good second-to-last number before finishing off with a ballad. Mm -hmm. This was written by, yes, Rudyard Kipling and adapted by Oli Speaks. Okay, so what happened was when Frank's album Come Fly With Me came out, the version released in the UK did not contain On the Road to Mandalay. Chicago was substituted in its place because Rudyard Kipling's daughter objected to word changes. Burma Girl had become Burma Broad, Temple Bells became Crazy Bells, and The Man Who Can Raise the Thirst became The Cat Who Could Raise the Thirst. Mm -hmm. But the song was restored to UK pressings in 1984. And then when the album was remastered, extra tracks were put on. So now both Chicago and Mandalay appear on the CD. Mm -hmm. Now Kipling wrote the poem in 1890. Per Wikipedia, the poem is set in colonial Burma, then part of British, British India. The protagonist is a cockney working class soldier back in grey restrictive London, recalling the time he felt free and had a Burmese girlfriend, now unattainably far away. And Burma is now Myanmar. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oli Speak set it to music in 1907. Frank's is the only version I've heard. It's unusual in that I really can't believe he could connect with this song on any level, but I Guess it means something to him. Mm. And it ends oddly, too. Frank repeats the chorus about the flying fish is playing and the dawn comes up like thunder. And then it ends. Yeah. Like he doesn't sing the line about out of China across the bay. But I like it because it's kind of startling in a way. Like the dawn comes up like thunder. Bam. That's it. Mm -hmm. And a song. Mm -hmm. Final track, Night and Day. But first, vibraphone solo. I think this would be a good song for people in a long distance relationship. 
Frank can't stop thinking of his partner and probably of all the things he would like to do with them when they finally meet up together. And as the passion builds, so does Sinatra's enthusiasm, and you want to see him happy in his lover's arms. This was written by Cole Porter, and it's been covered a lot. Oh, yeah. But the only versions I've heard are Frank's, and a few different versions by him, too. I have his first version that he recorded in 1942, and he sounds so different. Mm. It's like he seems almost tentative the way, in the way that he sings it, like, I'm singing Cole Porter's song. I better not screw this up. Mm. And uh, you, too... I know their version when they recorded it for the first Red Hot and Blue compilation album, which it's okay. I know the other version, uh, James Darren from his album, This One's From The Heart, which he released after playing Big Fontaine on Deep Space Nine. That mm -hmm. was pretty good. Anyway, this Frank version, he's in control, of course, because, you know, he's, had, he's been with this song for 17 years. And I think he makes it swing, which is not something you would expect with this song, because the very first version that he did in 42, it's very... It's very slow. It's almost like a dirge. I think I've heard that one, but I can't remember. Yeah. Um, and, oh, I know that the vibraphone is Red Norvo's instrument, but I find it intrusive on this song. Oh, okay. Um, and that is it. That's the album. I love this album because it takes Frank out of the Vegas element. He's not goofing around. There's no shtick. And... Not until towards the end. There's no big band either. It's just Frank, Red, and the quintet. And I think that made him more exposed to the audience, like put him out there more. Mm. And he rises to the occasion. He delivers. And again, the sound on this album isn't that great, mm. but it's still a performance for the ages. And it's highly, highly recommended. Overall, this is a great album to listen to if you want an example of Sinatra Sinatra's mm. showmanship. This is the closest anyone could ever get nowadays to seeing him live since he's no longer with us, but live recordings give you a bit of a taste. And for singers, it's an important album to listen to to remind you why sincerity is so important to capture a song's story. Great listen, and would recommend to Sinatra fans or those checking out his music for the first time. All right, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of my dad listens to this. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz, because the more you interact with the video, the more views we're likely to get on the YouTube homepage. I am also on social media, so if you follow me there, I post the episodes there. If you listen to us on SoundCloud, please leave a review or a like. And if you're friends with my dad, then you can email him with what you would like to hear, and he will email you an episode right to your inbox. As always... Thank you for listening to the latest installment of my dad listens to this. We'll be back next time with another album to nitpick and gripe about. Dad, anything you want to say before we sign off? Two things. One, tasteless joke time. What's green and sings? What? Frank Sinatra. Okay. And two, come podcast with me. We'll cast, we'll cast away. Eat Not your... like a Tom Hanks castaway. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Jesse McAnally. Bye.